momentarily. We're going to try to get started here in just a couple minutes. We'll try to start right at 7 o'clock. So if you have not yet found your seat, please come right on in. And if you need any help finding a seat, find an usher with a name tag or an usher without a name tag. <laughs> They'll help you. I'll just mention a couple of things now before we get started uh, to keep in mind during the concert tonight. If for some reason you need to leave during the music, we would ask that you uh, please use the doors in the back. Uh, the doors on the side open to the outside and they're a little more of a distraction. So if you do have to go out, we would ask you to go out through the back. Um, if you have young children with you tonight or somebody that needs to be uh, neither seen nor heard, uh, there is a room over on my left and your right um, that is available that you can get in through the door in the back um, where you can see and hear, but no one will know that you're there. So you can make use of that if you need it. Um, if you, uh, we ask that you please don't take any unauthorized videos or uh, photographs tonight. Those things tend to distract others around you. In fact, if you have any kind of electronic device, cell phone, etc., we would ask if you would, please turn it off for the music tonight unless you need that for emergency purposes. We would appreciate that. Um, what have I forgotten? In the event of an emergency landing, oxygen will be coming down from the ceiling. <laughs> Just checking to see if you're listening to me. We'll tune up in just a second, and we'll get started in a couple of minutes. Thank you. It's going to get so quiet that you're going to have to sit down. <laughs> Good evening to you all and welcome. Thank you very much for coming out to spend this evening with us as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. We've got folks here tonight from all over the country and all over the world, actually. And a lot of folks have been here for the for the week, spending time with us in the Word of God and fellowship and prayer, and it's, we've just had a wonderful time. It's been a, good to see folks from all over and have this time to share. So a lot of them are still with us tonight, and then lots more. So welcome to all of you. I'm going to share just a few remarks uh, and a story with you before we begin the music tonight. We're here tonight to celebrate the most selfless act in the history of the world that the one truly innocent human being in whom dwelt the fullness of the Almighty God chose to sacrifice himself just to give unworthy sinners like you and me the chance to discover love. 
The Bible tells us this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and so we ought to lay down our lives for one another. So this passage tells us that his self-sacrificial love is our example for how we, in turn, must love others. The problem, of course, is that self-sacrifice runs contrary to the selfishness ingrained in human nature. When my son Andrew was about four years old, he came into the kitchen one day and he found his mom mixing cake frosting with a hand mixer. He immediately perceived an opportunity in store to lick the beaters. Who has licked the beaters before? That's what I thought. You, you know what I'm talking about. He asked how soon she would be done so he could get started. He then candidly voiced his concern that she hurry up because he was afraid that his older brother, Blair, might come in before he was done, and then he would have to share the beater licking. His mom gently asked, well, don't you want to share with Blair? That would be the unselfish thing to do. Jesus said we should do unto others what we would have them do unto us. Andrew's little brow furrowed up. After some serious deliberation, he finally said, Well, a little bit I want Blair to have some, but a lot I want to have it all myself. <laughs> <laughs> Loving your neighbor as yourself just doesn't come easy for any of us. The Bible tells us that an expert in the Jewish law, upon hearing Jesus affirm the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself, defensively asked, and who is my neighbor? It seems that this religious expert wanted to limit the term neighbor to a narrow description that would eliminate certain undesirable people from his realm of responsibility. I'm afraid many today would like to do the same to avoid any obligation to love certain people, perhaps those of a different ethnic group or social strata or those on the other side of the political aisle. In any case, Jesus answered this question, who is my neighbor, with the familiar parable of the Good Samaritan. In this parable, three travelers, a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan, all encounter a stranger in great need. But only the Samaritan stops to help him. It would seem significant that this story offers a description not of what kind of person deserves our love, but of what kind of person we must be to truly love anyone that we find in need. In other words, to Jesus, it was not a question of what others must do to become qualified as worthy neighbors. It was a question of what we would be willing to do to become a good neighbor ourselves. Martin Luther King Jr. put it this way, the first question which the priest and the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But the good Samaritan reversed the question, if I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? And the incredible thing about Jesus, of course, was that he not only told stories like this that illustrated unselfishness as an abstract ideal, he lived out his love for us. He became the ultimate example of how we then ought to love our neighbors. For greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Perhaps a recent story about a neighbor would help to illustrate the point. Now, this is a true story. This took place over the last few years in our sister community up in Montana. Some years ago, our community acquired a piece of ranch land up there near the small town of Big Timber. In the process of the transaction, the previous owners informed us that the nearest neighbor was an old bachelor in his late 70s named Gene Forster. Gene's grandfather was a German immigrant and was the first person besides Native Americans to have lived on the ranch where Gene was born and lived all of his life. Gene had never married, and his personality 
was reputed to be as rugged as the craggy stone cliffs that towered above his rundown cottage. His front yard featured a rusting collection of about 30 dysfunctional trucks, tractors, and other ranch equipment. He was known for failing to pay his debts, and the locals mostly avoided him. Even the sheriff admitted to being afraid to go by his place. Folks wondered if anyone would bother to attend his funeral when he died. A while back, a young couple from our community here in Texas named Jake and Ruth moved up to Montana and began helping out on the community ranch. Jake recalls that the first time he met Gene was one day about seven years ago when he was driving past Gene's driveway. Gene waved him down and said, I heard you were going to be cleaning my house. Jake tried to tell him that he was not aware of that arrangement, <laughs> but Gene would hear none of it. I'll see you this afternoon, he said. When Jake arrived that afternoon, he immediately realized that this was more than an afternoon's project. He was astonished to find Gene's little house packed to the ceiling with a lifetime's accumulation of miscellaneous garbage, broken furniture, empty bottles, old clothes, and worse. They didn't make much progress on cleaning the house that day, but it was the beginning of a relationship. And Jake began spending many days with Gene, helping him fix his many broken fences, feed his cows, and do other ranch work. Jake recalls, he was very set in his ways and insisted that everything be done exactly the way he wanted. Every time we fed hay to the cows, he would have me save the baling twine and add it to a very large pile in front of his house. He often educated me on the different uses of old baling twine. He told me that it could repair a calf's broken leg, mend fencing, or hold a transmission in his old truck. <laughs> I spent many days just trying to figure out exactly what he wanted me to do on the ranch. He was challenging to work with. I never felt like I could do anything exactly the way he wanted me to. Many times he told me I was fired although he never paid me to work for him. <laughs> Jake clearly remembers the first time Gene ever thanked him for anything. Jake and Ruth were living in a small house in Big Timber at the time, and one winter night at 1 o'clock in the morning, the electricity went off, and it was 30 degrees below zero. Jake knew that Gene's house was only heated by electricity. So he got up, got dressed, and drove out to Gene's ranch and knocked on the door. It was deadly cold inside the house, and Gene was in there shaking, even though he had every blanket he owned wrapped around him. Jake invited him to come home with him and warm up. As soon as he had helped Gene into the truck, the electricity came back on. Well, I appreciate that you thought of me, Gene said, climbing back out of the truck. But I would have been fine without you. <laughs> Not long after that, Gene became very ill and had to spend some time in the hospital. Jake took the opportunity to tackle the house cleaning. With the help of others in the community, he hauled no less than 35 cubic yards of junk out of Gene's bedroom, kitchen, and living room. When Gene came home from the hospital, he complained that he couldn't find his toothbrush because they'd moved everything. <laughs> Since the living room carpet was visible for the first time in decades, the next day, Jake came over to vacuum the floor. Gene watched from his chair. When Jake stopped the vacuum to empty the clogged vacuum bag, Gene said, <clears throat> You missed a spot over by the piano. The following year, Gene was again in the hospital for an extended time. A social worker who knew of his living conditions refused to let him return to his home to live alone. Gene was very upset and refused to make any changes, insisting that everything was fine the way that it was. Jake and Ruth proposed that he could live in an apartment connected to their home. After many days of adamant refusal, Gene finally and reluctantly accepted. 
This began a season where Jake and Ruth washed his laundry, cleaned his apartment, and cooked all his meals, though Gene was never quite happy with the way his food was cooked. Jake and Ruth and their young children visited with him often. At times, he seemed to enjoy their company, but just as often, he would reprimand Jake about something he wanted done differently on his ranch. As Gene began to speak more freely, it became evident that deep inside, he was as hard and bitter as the long Montana winters he'd endured for 80 years. He blamed his deceased father and his brother for the many disappointments of his life. Though his brother was his only living close relative, Gene deeply resented him and hadn't even spoken to him in 18 years. Jake tried several times to gently suggest that Gene needed to face these issues and overcome his bitterness. But every time, Gene would become angry and cut off the conversation. You don't understand what I've been through, he would snap. Gene's health continued to deteriorate, and soon Jake and Ruth were having to attend to all his personal needs. But when it came to pain, Gene was a tough cookie. He casually informs Jake one day that he had a toothache. One look inside his mouth and convinced Jake that the situation was dire. So he told Gene he needed to see a dentist immediately. Don't tell me what to do, Gene barked. Jake was heading to church, so he told Gene that if he wasn't doing a lot better by the time he got home, Jake would insist on emergency help. When Jake returned to check on him, Gene had a triumphant grin on his face. Look, he said. He opened his hand, and there was his tooth. He would pulled it out himself. Given these experiences, when Jake went to feed Gene his breakfast one morning in early 2020 and found him groaning in pain, he knew Gene was in serious trouble. Against Gene's protests, Jake took him into the emergency room. After some tests and a CAT scan, the doctor came out and explained that Gene had a pinched intestine and it was infected. His blood was already septic and he likely only had 24 hours to live. Gene was furious. Over and over he demanded, do something and do it now. The doctor transferred him to a larger hospital in Billings but there was little that could be done for him. Jake stayed at the hospital late that night, talking with him. When he would gently try to help Gene face reality, Gene would retort, You're just a doomsday person. Jake finally left around 3 o'clock in the morning. He prayed for Gene the whole 75-mile drive home. The next day, Gene was still alive, but slowly fading. Jake again spent the day with him, but Jake's own father unexpectedly began to suffer severe pain that night, so Jake had to leave to take him to another hospital in a different town. After taking care of his father, Jake again set out on the long drive back to the Billings Hospital, not knowing how many hours Jean had left. On the way, his phone rang. It was Brother Nathan, a pastor here in our Texas community. Brother Nathan's here tonight. He'd heard about Jake's father and was calling to see how things were. Jake began to tell him about Gene's situation and how he was at a loss for how to reach him. Among many other things, Nathan told him, Jake, whatever Gene needs to do or become, you must do and become. If he needs to repent and learn how to love, you must come to him in repentance and love. Love always goes first. As the song says, this is how love wins every single time, climbing high upon a cross where someone else should die. Jake pulled over into a rest area to pray. It seemed like a lot to ask. After all, when you looked at the scales, at all that he'd already done for Gene, and how little he'd received in return. It didn't appear that the obligation was on him to sacrifice even more. 
But Jake knew he'd heard the truth from Brother Nathan. As the occasional car zipped past on the lonely Montana freeway, he poured out his soul to God and asked for grace to go the extra mile. An hour later, he was back at Gene's bedside. Amidst the whirring and beeping of life support machinery, Jake sat down and began to humble himself and share his heart. He asked Gene to forgive him for all the times he fell short and how he helped him. He mentioned a time he'd forgotten to do something on the ranch. He told Gene he was sorry and asked him again to forgive him. Gene stared at him. Then he suddenly reached over and gripped Jake's hand. No, no, he said. I need you to forgive me. I am the one that needs forgiveness. I'm so sorry for the way I've treated you. Please tell Ruth she is the best cook and that I'm sorry I ever complained. Jake could hardly believe it, but Gene wasn't finished. Jake, get your phone and call my brother. Please tell him I need to talk to him. After 81 years of resistance, the dam had finally burst and grace and mercy poured in like a flood. Then the ripples started rolling out from that little hospital room. Gene's brother immediately got in his truck and started the five-hour drive to the hospital. In the meantime, one by one, Gene contacted different friends and neighbors to open his heart. Then he asked for his checkbook and started writing checks to all the people that he owed money to. As soon as Gene's brother walked in the door of the hospital room, they both burst into tears. Jake quietly slipped out. And the brothers talked together for six hours. When Jake returned, they were both laughing as they reminisced about their childhood. Gene's brother later told Jake, Gene has never been so kind to me in my whole life. Then, to everyone's surprise, Gene's health miraculously improved. The doctor came in at the end of that week and said, well, I think we had a misdiagnosis. Gene said, no, I think Jesus touched me. Gene went on to live another two years and was a very happy man. He always told Ruth she was the best cook ever. He loved music and he often asked for young people in our community to come and sing to him. Though he was frail, he insisted on attending our Montana community fair, and he wanted to sit on the front row in the music tent. When they started singing the final song, he asked those sitting beside him to help him stand. Then he raised both hands in the air and held them there as the words, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, rang out across the Montana plains. Chuck and Beth, Don and Maria and many others in our Montana community helped take care of Gene's every need. When his health got to the point where he needed full-time medical care, they moved him to the local nursing home, and some of the nurses working there had known him their whole lives. They told Jake, he's a changed man. They said he never once complained. Three months ago, Gene passed from this life in victory and peace. The day before, with a weak voice, he told Jake and Ruth through tears, I love you, and I love Jesus. His last words to his brother right before he died were, I love you, and I'll see you someday again. A bunch of folks from the town, as well as our entire Montana community, came out for the funeral. Another old neighbor who'd known Gene his whole life said, I know what happened to him and I was so honored to be his pallbearer. One of our songs tonight says, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. And that's what we're here to celebrate tonight. The great love of our God, who was willing to leave his heavenly throne to be our humble neighbor, who looked past the heap of accumulated wreckage in the wake of humanity and believed that with enough care and love, we could be different. When we were hopeless, 
His love was relentless. He didn't look at the scales of all He'd already done for us and how little we had done for Him. He just believed that if He paid the price and went first, we could be loved into loving. Gandhi once said, You must become the change you wish to see in the world. God knows how desperately this world needs love in these times. What would be possible if each of us would truly love our neighbor as ourselves? What if an entire community could become a living example of that love? And then what if more and more little clusters started springing up in many other places? All people daring to love each other and their neighbors no matter what. The ripples of resurrection and hope could reach to the ends of the earth. So, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, don't you think it's time? It's our hope and prayer that even tonight we might come together to be the change we wish to see in the world as we remember the one who gave it all to make that possible. Please join us as we celebrate and propagate the wonder-working power of the love of Jesus Christ. Oh, I- 
justified, yes. He freed me forever. And one day he's coming back, glorious day. came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, our example is he. Oh, yes. And buried, he carried my sins far away, and rising, he justified, free me. He's coming back, glorious day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain, one day Suffering in anguish, despised and rejected, bearing my sins, our Redeemer is He. Hallelujah. Oh, and Mary, He carried my sins far away, and rising, He justified, He freed me. Oh, and one day, one day the grave could conceal Him no longer. The past that held regret over my head is gone. These chains are ashes now, they once were rusted on. I was a runaway, but now I'm finally home. Mm. My mind was a ghost town haunted by yesterday. Until your hand reached down, pulled me out of the grave into the freedom found only in Jesus' name. I am forgiven, no longer lost. Now the scales are gone, my eyes can finally see. I'll tell the world of it all, Jesus has done for me. I am forgiven. No longer Oh, 
Straying in sin's dark valley, and no hope within could I see. Then they search through heaven. found a Savior that could save a poor lost soul like me. Chilling waters, I'll soon be crossing, but I'll not fear, cause he'll lead me, he's gonna lead me, say, oh. Yeah. 
buried in my shame. But through the darkness, you reached out and you called me by name. Waves of fear all around. I never thought I would be found. But you heard my cry and rescued me. Love lifted me. Taking me to higher ground on a solid rock I stand. The grace has carried me so far, I'm never going back again. All my life I give it now, all I am I lay it down. Lord, I surrender.
my Jesus set me free. Look at the wounds that give me life, grace flowing from his side, no greater sacrifice. What he the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. And I praise God for what he's done. Oh, sing for the freedom he has won. Even death is dead and done. His life is overcome. Oh, speak, say the name above all names. Over every broken place, he is risen from the grave. What he's done.
give glory to God together and sing all together now. I'll never forget what he's done. I'll never forget what he's done. I'll never forget, Lord. I'll never forget what he's done. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, and the hush of mercy breathing, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, hear the host of angels sing, glory to the newborn King, and the sound joy repeating Jesus saves see the humblest hearts adore him Jesus saves Jesus saves and the wisest bow before him Jesus saves Jesus saves See the sky alive with praise Melting darkness in its place There is light forevermore in Jesus said We will live our sorrow sharing Jesus said
He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. He will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Nearer, my God, to Thee, nearer to Thee, even though it be a cross that raiseth me. Still all my song shall be Nearer, my God, to Thee Nearer, my God, to Thee Nearer to Thee Angels to beckon me nearer, my God, to Thee. Nearer, my God, to Thee. Nearer to Thee. Excelsior, 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 Excelsior.
high noon in the valley of the shadow when the deep of the valley was bright and the mouth of the tomb shouted glory he is alive so long new ages of sin go on don't you come back again I've been raised and redeemed you lost all your sting to the victor of the battle at high noon in the valley in the valley of the shadow well the demons they danced in the darkness as that last ragged breath left his lungs and they reveled and howled at the war that they thought they had won. But then in the dark of the grave, the stone rolled away in the stillness of dawn. was shot through with light. Jesus took in that breath and shattered all death with his life. So long, you ages of sin, go on, don't you come back again. I've been raised and redeemed, you've lost all your 
Let the people rejoice, let the heavens resound, and let the name of Jesus who sought us and freed us forever ring out. All praise to the fighter.
taught me how to watch and pray and how to live rejoicing every day celebrate jesus is alive oh he's alive oh.
Jesus. Can I just close with a word of prayer? We've got to thank God for what we felt here tonight. Oh, Lord, we're so thankful. God, we are undeserving of the presence that we felt here tonight. But we are so thankful that your resurrection is not a thing of the past, that you are alive today by your Holy Spirit moving in your people. We thank you for the life, for the love. We thank you, Jesus, for the example of your life. We thank you for the sacrifice of your death. And we thank you for the victory of your resurrection. Lord, I thank you for all these that have come from near and far to be here with us tonight. Would you please watch over each and every one of them as they go out from here to spread the love and life that we felt here tonight to our neighbors. Lord, be with us. Thank you in the precious, wonderful, matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, Thanks again for coming out to be with us. You are welcome to stay around and visit with us for a while. They'll be having refreshments in the building, the fellowship hall, which is that away. And you are welcome to stay as long as you'd like. God bless you. Have a happy holiday.